This isn't your grandma's cancer show. Not your grandma's cancer show. Hi, I'm Tatum Duroc, and today we're talking about why being a parent with cancer can be especially isolating. Because we know from parents that they often have friends that have kids about the same age, and they sometimes have cancer friends, but they don't necessarily have kids. And so it can be really tough to find people in the same position, going through the same challenges, the same juggling acts, the same plates in the air, all while handling treatment and everything that goes with it. So today I have two amazing guests. I'm so happy to have them both with me. So we've got Mark, who's joining us over Zoom. And Mark has two sons um, who were three and five when he was originally diagnosed and I also have with me in the studio Sarah and Sarah how old was your daughter when you were diagnosed? So um, she was two the first time I was diagnosed and she was five and a half the second time. Okay so tell me what was going on in your life when you were first diagnosed? Yeah so um, I was a year into a promotion so I'd gone back to work after being on maternity leave and um, yeah and I'd made the decision that to go for yeah to go for a promotion and then I was just about a year into that um, my my father had died um, so he died in the March and then I was diagnosed in the June time. So there was a lot going on. Yeah, so a two-year-old. Yeah. You're grieving your father. Yeah. And then how how did you know that something was up? How did... It... Yeah, so I think... Um, so, I'd, so I didn't have any of what was um, advertised as the kind of main sort of symptoms at that point. So I basically had a thickening under my collarbone. So, and I remember sort of feeling it and, and thinking, oh, you know, that feels a bit strange. And, um, you know, as everyone does, even back then, look on Google um, and, and basically made the decision myself that I'd just sort of see how, how it went. Because that's basically was the advice was just, you know, kind of follow any changes over the kind of course of your you know menstrual cycle and I felt it was getting bigger and it was waking me up in the night and it was painful so I went to the doctors and um, she was very clear straight away that it was she was concerned about it so I was referred under the two-week rule and um, I went to a kind of um, I think it was like a kind of one-stop clinic basically where they did all the tests the same day so I found out very very quickly that I had breast cancer so your daughter's two. Yeah. What did she understand? Yeah. yeah. Did she understand that you were ill? Did she understand that you might be sensitive? Like, because you had... Um, t- talk to me a little bit about your treatment. Yeah. So I suppose when I think about my treatment, I think about my treatment over the kind of course of sort of four or five years, because I went through um, chemotherapy surgery, radiotherapy, and then I had about a year, and then I had um, preventative surgery. So we kind of went through that, and then I was unfortunately diagnosed again. So I think when I think about my daughter, um, the the kind of the journey, as it were, from her childhood Mm -hmm. began when she was about two. Um, and really kind of continued in an intense way until she was about six and then we had some respite and then I had another kind of phase of illness due to my due to side effects of my treatment so I suppose for me for us um, I sort of see it that you know it's really hard for me to admit this but I feel like cancer has been like the background music has been like the soundtrack if you like to her childhood so when we look back at pictures of her at her third birthday you know at a Christmas you know there's me with no hair or with hair so in that sense I feel like it was a a, you know a huge part of her life and impacted on her and me as a mum in different ways at different times but I think to answer your question when she was two I don't know, I think what was really, you know, when a, a two-year-old, you know, I think they're, they're, they're so, I, I mean, she was my baby, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I thought of her as my baby, and I think that she was my, 
the the main thing I was worried about. And I don't, I think something she just took in her stride is kind of normal. And I think other things were maybe um, less obvious, um, yeah, in terms of the impact on her, you know, more emotional rather than, so things like, I think she's completely unfazed by me losing my hair, for example, the first time. Um, I don't, I think she understood when I had an operation that mummy had a hurt, you know, she had to be mm -hmm. careful. I think she knew that. But I think that over time I came to realise it was things like being separated from me or me being unavailable to her. And I remember when I was going through chemotherapy, what she found really hard was either mummy was ill in bed and she could manage that or mummy was up and could pick her up and play with Playmobil and, you know, all those kinds of expectations that she had. She couldn't cope with this sort of the movement between the, mm. the two kind of... Um, yeah, these, these these two different ways of, of being that you end up having as someone who's going through cancer treatment, really. So I think for me, it was like the kind of inconsistency that she found hard. And of course, everything you read about, you know, talks about consistency. And so I think when you're in that situation and you know you're not being consistent, you, you know, it sort of sets up a tension. Yeah. And Mark, hearing this... Does does any of this resonate with you? Because I know that your younger son was three, so it's similar similar age. Um, how how was how was that for you? Tell me what was going on in your life when you were diagnosed. Well, first, yes, a lot of what Sarah just said resonates for sure. So, um, but I will will come down to that in a little bit. Um, so, where was I in life? I was truthfully sort of relatively 2.4 children like yeah you know, i was so i had a good job my wife had a good job our kids were, were well well actually we'd had quite a um uh struggle uh with our second born he was born very prematurely he was three and a half months premature and he was born he's one pound five ounces or three ounces sorry um he was given a real sort of window of he might not make it wow. he, had to be careful, he was going to make it he then was told that um you know he's likely going to have some sort of behavioral and physical difficulty um to this day and as he stands and i use normal in inverted commas but he lives a normal life he's he definitely is left here but that's the only sort of um uh, collateral damage if you like of that start to life so up until that point you know we, we had a good life we, we we enjoyed life um good friends good family obviously not everything perfect but you know mm -hmm. in, in all everything was, was in a good place um and then i had a problem um with um around my sort of bowel colon movements um i didn't feel particularly well typically um, i don't know if it says that typically that's unfair but i went to see my gp four or five times and every time it was like you're fine it's just irritable bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome you'll be absolutely fine anyway i went for colonoscopy found out i had cancer in the in the colon thinking that was it and that would be i could manage that um i then went to see the doctor three days later who turned around and said it had actually metastasized or spread to my liver. I had 30 plus tumors in my liver. I was told I had less than a year to live and um, obviously <laughs> world thrown upside down. So um, how did I deal with that? The next day was, was one of my sort of still, one of those memories that still burns in my brain in that I had the, the palliative care team came over to see me um, to talk to me about you know what I needed to do, basically get my affairs and life in order and kind of like, well, literally just one day after being told you're now coming to tell me how i've got to sort of conclude my life wow um, and i wasn't particularly ready for that so <laughs> i had to leave the meeting about i don't know 30 minutes into it just like i can't deal with this i've got to go to bed uh, and part of that conversation was how to talk to your children and um again you know all these things just suddenly hit you oh my god i haven't thought about that i haven't considered that i'm just still thinking about what this means uh, and then suddenly you're like, right, well, you've got to start telling your kids that, you know, things aren't looking great for you and that you likely are not going to be around. Um, so, yeah, so that was kind of how it all sort of came to fruition, how it all happened. But fast forward, I'm what, five years on just. Um, I've had 125 rounds of chemo. I've had in excess of 20 operations, radiotherapy, I'm about to start another session of operations and radiotherapy because I've got some new tumors that have just emerged. Uh, I just had an operation two days ago, so I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, so yeah, so look, so my, my work and my life is ongoing. This is like, I've got to treat cancer like chronic illness. Uh, how does that then impact me as a parent? Well, Sarah's alluded to some really good points. I think from, from my perspective, 
Um, you know, I think we are socially conditioned and encouraged to grow up. That family is everything. Family is what we live for, and, and they are the things that we're closest to, and the bonds that we have are the strongest with family. And that was something I, I buy into, I believe, and, and, and something I, I wanted to live life by. And I created that sort of dynamic, that culture within our family, that we were there for each other and we created that family. And I think that's probably the thing I found hardest of all is that you, I am now the thing that is uncertain in that unity. Right. I am now the person who might break that certainty and, and you know, from pr preaching and practicing a culture of, you know, we're here for each other um, to then suddenly being like, mm, I can't do that anymore. Um, because I might not be here. And at that point, there was a very good chance I wouldn't be here. And, you know, I didn't want to continue down that path when I was going to be a person who was going to be responsible for that not coming to fruition. So, um, you know, that's one of the things I found very tough to sort of contend with because it's still something I believe in. It's still something I'm passionate about. And I can't convey it really because I can't, I still don't know what my future looks like. Yeah. How was that initial conversation with your children? I mean, it sounds like talk about being a, a day later having the team come out and wanting you to have any kind of head around that information is is crazy did you feel that you had to tell your children immediately did you take time um yeah, I mean, I went to bed, so I, I took some initial time. Yeah. And then um, yeah, I spoke to my wife, Barry, afterwards, and we sort of just sat on it for, I think, a couple of weeks. And then we sort of just mentioned, and I think Sarah's already used some of the sort of terminology you kind of try and make it child friendly. And it's just like, you know, daddy's not very well. And um, he's going to have to have some operations and some treatment, and, and, you know, everything crossed that he will be okay. And so you still have to be, I think that's another part of this, which is difficult that you, even though something significant is happening to you you still have to be a support for your kids yeah you to make them feel comfortable and, and confident in their surroundings and secure and, and happy if you can and you know that, that's another big challenge of this that you're sort of like well i also need support you know and ideally i need support from you and if you're a bit older and understood this a bit better we could perhaps have that bond um but you can't you have to be the support for them so you have to dumb everything down you have to make everything seem like it's just normal life um or part of life and, and hopefully i'll be fine and, and there's nothing to worry about but obviously you know that there is quite a lot to worry about and that's that that i find that difficult as well that dynamic's quite a, a tough line to tread um i think now they're now what 11 and 8 and the conversation evolved significantly but again i know we'll talk about that a bit later but it has evolved significantly there's a lot more awareness and understanding now and that bond is and that dynamic is changing maybe um and that's great for me. I love that. Um, that they're getting their head around it a little bit. So, um, yeah. I, I, I apologies if I'm probably on that. No, to... no. Oh, I'm. I'm so glad that um, you're you're sharing this, and I know that it's going to be really useful. Um, I'm curious about um, the cancer being the soundtrack as to your your children's life. Was that something that you have thought about in that way? Or do you have like your own way that you've kind of I think, imagined? I think, I think Sarah's nailed it. I think that's a, it's it's a really great way of framing it that it is a soundtrack to the back you know, the background of your life. That you know there'll be some awareness, and there is awareness. Like you, know, you can't hide 125 grams of chemotherapy. You can't ride, hide operations. You have to tell them. There has to be some comms. There has to be some level of communication for them to be aware that you're not around or you need help or you are going to be ill for a little while um you know so that has to happen um and i think that is just as as you say you sort of look back at the, the old photos you look at what think back to all memories and you know it, there's so many things that are dotted with oh but that was impacted because of cancer or that happened because of cancer or we went there because of cancer like there's you know it, it, it absolutely forms so much of your decision making yeah uh, that how can it not be the background music it's, it's articulated perfectly I'm going to open this question up to both of you. I know from talking to a number of parents that they have you know, parent guilt, you know, about how to do things and this pressure of being a good parent or the perfect parent. Do you think cancer amps that up? 
Or do you think there are some things that you've kind of put aside because you're like, actually, that's not that important? Or does it matter? <laughs> like, Does it vary from day to day? And um, Sarah, if I could ask you that first. I think it does vary um, from day to day and how you feel. I think when you're a parent you're with cancer your parenting values shift so maybe what matters one day maybe doesn't matter so much the next I think the awful truth is that I just felt this overwhelming sense of guilt for being the person in the family with cancer a bit like Mark said you know it was my job to protect my daughter and I was the one I was the person that was bringing this worry in But in a strange way, that was also liberating because it meant that I I didn't care so much about the things that had mattered to me. I didn't care if my house was a mess anymore because I knew what really mattered was being able to spend time with my daughter. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it changed everything, but in ways that I can explain now that I couldn't really explain then. I think, you know, like Mark said, it's just this sense of wanting to keep normality going for your children, but also you need the normality yourself because it kind of holds you in this sort of storm of cancer that's going on and you're you're in the centre of it. So I think for me, um, I wanted to make up for it in some way. I felt Mm. like I wanted to, um, yeah, I wanted to... The energy I did have, the little energy I had, would be spent on my daughter. You know, she was my focus, as it were, sometimes at the expense of myself. So I think that, um, yeah, linked to what Mark said earlier, I think for me, I I never really expected my daughter to kind of care for me in some of the ways that I've seen and heard about in some of the the blogs and the information I never wanted her to have that responsibility for me um I wanted to you know I kind of felt like I wanted to sort of cherish her in a way so I I think though linked to your earlier point about isolation that the difficulty about that for me was that I just felt completely isolated from other parents and their worries Mm. and at two I don't know whether Mark would agree with me, but I think there's quite a lot of sort of, not rivalry, but there's a lot of comparisons going on about my child's, you know, out of nappies or my child's sleeping at night or I don't want my child watching CBeebies or I don't want my child eating processed food. And I'd be like, you know, who, 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 I don't care about that. You know, if my life is not going to be as long as I want it to be, that's not my priority at this point. So I think it really um, had a, a, a massive impact on, on me, on, on, on us in that way, in the way that I, I thought, the mum that I was going to be, actually. Right. Yeah. And, and I know that for you, Mark, your parenting style changed during that. And I, I find it really interesting, um, you know, that both of you are several years past. So, like, um, to be able to reflect back on sort of where you were initially after diagnosis and now kind of like kind of unraveling and, and you know, reflecting on... Um, how things have changed. So, yeah, so, Mark, how would, how would you describe your parenting style pre? My parenting style pre, so I was, I, look, this again, I, I make no apologies, um, but I've evolved and changed. I, my, my, again, was, was, you know, as I reflect on it, it was through social conditioning. My, my father was, was authoritative, um, and I parented authoritatively. Um, and then, so my, as I've already alluded to, my second born and through his Trials and tribulations, which led to us having to live sort of slightly differently. He used to have a, an oxygen machine following him around everywhere he went for the first two years of his life. Um, and that created challenges where being an authoritative parent perhaps wasn't the right approach. Um, so I'd actually just started having therapy with, you know, I had a sort of conversation with my wife going, I don't want to be this guy, this is not the guy I want to be. Um, so I had a chance with, and so she was like, well, see a therapist, talk about it. So I went to see a therapist, started talking about how I was parenting. And literally the week after I'd had my last session, um, I got diagnosed with cancer. So I was a bit like, can we, yeah. can we keep going, please? Yeah, I, 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 might, I might need a bit of help. Yeah. Um, so, 
So I'd actually started to evolve my parenting already into being you know, much more educational, much more supportive, much more just leading with kindness. I know it's a bit cliche, but leading with kindness and, and trying to be much more educational and supportive rather than uh, authoritative. Um, so yeah, that was a big transition for me anyway. And then sort of leading into that. And actually, you know, I think Sarah has just alluded to two really great points. I think obviously it, the parent guilt everyone has. We know, we know that. Um, oh, sorry, everyone who has children has parent guilt. And, um, but I think there are two things, there are two sides to it. it. It in some ways can accentuate and make it harder, the parent guilt, but in other ways, I think, and I, on a bigger picture, I think, you know, and I said to quite a lot of people, cancer's enhanced my life. Like it's made me rethink everything. It's made me reflect on things that I previously thought were important and look at things now in a very different light. You know, work is a good example. I still I've worked all the way through my treatment, but I don't care for work anymore. Like in the, in the, in the sense of my own ambition and in the sense of my own you know, where I want to be in life with work. I'm, I like work because it gives me purpose and it gives me value. But after that, I'm not you know, desperately wanting to be you know, uber successful or remote business or anything like that. None of that matters anymore. Um, through to how a parent, how I live my life. And the thing that defines me as a human is relationships. I love family, friends. That's, that's what drives me. That's what gives me energy every day. And, this process reinforced that having cancer made me go, well, that's what I want. That's what I want to achieve. And all right, I've got nine months to do it, but I'm going to re rectify some of these things. So I stopped working and work from home. I um, started spending more time with my kids. I've started spending more time with people I love, supporting my wife while being a more supportive husband while she pursued her own career. Um, so, you know, taking on different challenges and how that then changes you as a parent, you then sit down and go, well, you know, does it matter if my kid has an hour and a half screen time versus an hour screen time? You know, people do compare themselves all the time mm -hmm. to what their, you know, what their pet kids should have and shouldn't have. And, and, you know, you still get comments, even to this day, where you're still like, come on, really, we're still doing this to each other. We're still creating a toxic environment to make ourselves feel guilty and shameful because our kids spent a bit too long watching Netflix or started playing a computer game that's slightly older for him or I, come on. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> really, unless, unless you have, the, the kid is displaying behaviors that are causing problems to the children or it's starting to impact other people that's when it's fine to to engage but prior to that like no so i think it's also made me a lot less tolerant of that sort of thing i'm i'm i just don't engage with like there's certain whatsapp groups that i've been involved in with parents that are like you know i'm doing this for x or we're doing this for y and you're like no nah, negative energy i'm not interested i'm out and i just leave the group like, i'm not down with that I don't need to feel that. And I think that's been another part of this whole journey for me is, you know, I've evolved significantly by removing as much negative energy in my life. And sadly that can come quite often from other parents. So I've had to remove myself from quite a lot of school situations and situations where I was dealing with other parents because I just don't get anything from it. I'm just getting negativity and, and toxicity. So yeah, I, I didn't part, I'm not a part of that. Yeah, and you know, and that's yeah going back to kind of that original thing that's quite isolating right like yeah. you know to have an experience even one that you know is giving kind of a perspective that's enriching your time it's still like yeah there's um it's almost like you're still outside of the you know these these grooves you know, and even though they might not be fun grooves to be on, such as, you know, that comparison thing, it's still like other people are there and you're in a different place. So how do you, how do you kind of, where do you go for figuring out like who yeah, to talk question. to, who's going to understand? It's a question I'm still trying to work out. I mean, obviously yeah. I've, I've had the pleasure of being at, at Shine, um, when we had our weekend away at uh, Bournemouth um, before lockdown and I got to meet 50 great people. Unfortunately at the time there was only three guys there so immediately my sort of group of potential, sorry four guys, potential people I could relate to is significantly decreased. I, 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 look, the, I could go into detail, I'm not going to. The bottom line is I've still yet to come across anyone who's in a situation similar to or exactly the same as mine. I don't know anyone. and. So naturally cancer isolates you in that way. That you, I mean, I'm sure Sarah's probably, even though there's people she can perhaps relate to or, or, or in similar dynamics or situations, I don't know, Sarah, sorry, I shouldn't talk for you, but I found it really hard to find anyone that's um, that I can truly relate to and we have a complete sort of 
similar life uh, together. Um, and I've looked, but I've, I've still not been able to find that. So I, there's an element of it, just, you just have to deal with it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know so I suppose one of the things that is um, unifying is the that sense of isolation, mm-hmm. of being out of the comparison mm-hmm. um, track, really. Mm-hmm. Um, have you found anyone else in a similar um, situation to you? Not, I, I think, uh, so for me, I think most definitely talking to other people who've had cancer has been a really important way that I've learned to cope and support myself. But I think that spaces for me as a kind of um, a mum with cancer um, and thinking about my child have been... um, I don't think I've found one, actually. I think maybe I can think of maybe a work- workshop or something like that. Um, but I think, you know, the, there are, there. I think there are a few factors, aren't there, that come into play. And I think quite often it's the, the age of your child mm-hmm. as well. So, you know, I've got friends with cancer maybe who've had older, older children than mine. Um, so I think there's there's something about negotiating different developmental stages yeah. um, and what treatment you're having at those points. And I think the kind of information around talking to can- to children about cancer too is, uh, you know, tends to be quite general. Mm-hmm. Doesn't necessarily, you know, as as a as a mum of a two year old, you know, I mean. Let's face it, we find it hard to talk about cancer to adults, isn't yeah. it? You know, let alone, you know, our children. So I think, um, yeah, no, so I think it's something that I learnt to perhaps to manage in a way and that I suppose my sort of identity as a parent somehow, I don't know, I'm, st- I'm thinking about it as we're talking. It kind of feels like, I suppose in one, on the one hand, I wanted to try and protect it somehow. But in in another sense, I just fake it, (laughs) you know. um, I I think I'm going to aspire to be more like you, Mark, and just think I'm walking away from that. (laughs) You know, so I tend to just smile and nod when people are perhaps sharing their worries Mm. um, and I don't relate to them and and maybe don't talk about mine. So it's a hidden part. It's a hidden part of my experience, I suppose. Yeah, and Um, I know that... Kynwin, who's been on the podcast several times, I remember her telling a story of going into work and she'd been um, in a hospital for about six months um, and had no hair and, you know, she hadn't had time with her new, but she had a newborn. Um, and so the her daughter was six months and she went into the office, you know, for that kind of first, you know, stepping back into the world after being in isolation for so long. And someone said, oh, how are you? And she said, oh, I'm really profoundly exhausted. And they went, oh, yeah, me too with my kid. (laughs) And you're like, oh, oh, you were trying so hard to relate. Mm. But actually, it's a different kind of tiredness, you know? So, like, no one's getting sleep, but there's a different kind of deprivation of sleep when you're going through chemo, you know, when you're going through scanxiety, when you're going through, like, you know, your hormones being up and down and all around. So I want to ask you, and I'm going to ask both of you, I'm going to start with um, Sarah. What happens on a day that, like, your bandwidth, you're so exhausted? Have you had, like, just bad days that you feel like, oh, my God, I, I literally just can't, you know, I I haven't behaved in a way that I would have liked to, Um like more irritable or making a weird decision that afterwards you're like, why did I do that? But it was the stress of everything that you're going through because stress is is huge in how, we, you know, our interpersonal relationships and adrenaline flowing. Did you ever find that to be tricky to manage? I think, um, so, that, so again, I think what's hard about that question is that, you know, every day is different so you know there was a time for example I remember when I come home and I'd been in high dependency care for a week and I'm literally unable to do anything you know I can't look after myself let alone my daughter and I think at those points I had to rely on her dad you know he was her main carer so I think and what was really hard for me at that point was to accept that you know I wasn't when she was that small, he became more important to her than me. 
And so, you know, that wasn't what I wanted. You know, in my daughter, you know, I knew she was going to be my only child. So, she, you know, I really wanted to try and make the most of being with her. So I think that um, rightly or wrongly, the way I cope with that was almost feeling like I had to be a bit saint-like. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I don't think I very often got cross, for example. I don't think... I think I was... I, I tended to react by being kind of more patient, perhaps, than most people. You know, it, when, when she had tantrums and she did have tantrums, you know, people would say to me, well, didn't you... Didn't you didn't you get her to clear up or didn't you didn't you set a boundary and I was like no I didn't <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the thing it's like everything becomes slightly skewed so stress is yeah yeah stress is massive because I think that parenting's hard under any circumstances and you know parenting and having cancer is hard but you've got this sort of double whammy effect of being a parent and having cancer and somehow you've got to reconcile the two things so and I think you know Mark said it earlier this idea that you're in the worst place that you can possibly be but you have to think about someone else yeah and I think in some ways though that gave me strength that I maybe wouldn't have had so there were most certainly times when I did things because she needed me that otherwise I would have stayed in bed I would have not got up you know I would not have pushed myself so Sorry, that was a bit of a long answer. No, oh, I, I, I love that answer. Um, Mark, how do you relate to to that? Yeah, I think, you know, that, well, in terms of related, yeah, I do, enormously. Um, I think... Uh, um, it's just making me tight thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, like, how many times have we done gone above and beyond to try and... Or how many times do I feel like I've gone above and beyond to try and facilitate that I'm still a good parent? You know, like, we wake, I wake up every day going, I want to be a good dad, I want to be a good husband, I want to be a good son, I want to be a good brother, whatever. I want to be good at what I define myself as. And being a good dad is absolutely one of those. So I've done things where I've got up at 5.30 in the morning to build a train track and, you know, I've had two hours sleep. I had chemotherapy the day before. I'm absolutely exhausted. And would I do that in any of the circumstances? No, definitely not. But, I would want to, but I'm doing it because I want to be there. I want to be part of their life. And I want to, you know, I was kind of like, well, I don't know how much time I'm going to get with them. So every time, every moment is precious. And whilst I'd rather not be doing this, I also, I'm desperate to be doing this. So it's also quite conflicting in yourself. Yeah. Sort of sitting, you know, I'm so tired. Yeah. <laughs> And, really and exhausting. Off. Like, yeah, I mean, that, that thing of, like, trying to seize every moment is mm. absolutely exhausting. Yeah, it is. And if you think that already exists in, on the average parent and amplify that with the potential... I mean, look, I know man and Sarah's dad... I'm sorry, Sarah, I don't actually know what your prognosis was, but, you know, I, I was given a definitive time frame. I was given, like, a year to sort of cram as much stuff in as I could. Um, and that was in itself just something made everything amplify everything you know because it's so much <laughs> but I'm not well um, so it's, yeah it's just trying to find that balance isn't it and I think you know one of the things I've put a lot of energy into through this is self care it's just been like you, you do the best you can do right mm -hmm. don't be hard on yourself don't give yourself a hard time there's going to be days where you're a bit shit there's going to be days where you can't quite you know operate at a level that you wish you could or want to in fact, there's quite a lot of days, or there's certainly moments between days where you just feel like that. Um, and you kind of just have to go, that's fine. That's not, you know, if, you, if it was an ideal world, you wouldn't have cancer and you wouldn't be dealing with this. So don't make that a deal for yourself. Don't make that, don't put that upon yourself and make yourself feel bad for it. No, manage it as best you can anyway. Um, and that's something I've put a lot of energy into doing um, and tried to cut myself quite a lot of slack, as well as trying to find ways to create great memories and moments with my kids. and that balance is something that I'm constantly evolving, adapting, changing hour by hour almost. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. And that adaptation, that evolving, like, like every new stage that your children are going through, it's a new stage, a new depth of their understanding as well. Yeah. So have they ever come to you and said something and you th like that was a bit surprising? what regarding my concert yeah yeah i mean I, the first time it sort of it was a well, we I, I think um willow the willow foundation do a sort of an away trip day and we went to london zoo with it which was very kind of them and wonderful anyway we rocked up and i had a disabled badge uh, because i wasn't very mobile at that point and um 
as we were coming up to the car parking place, we saw a parking tent and I sort of wound the window down. I was like, is there anywhere I need to say we're parking? And my eldest son just wound down his window and shouted out the back window, it's because my daddy's got cancer. I'm like, oh, all right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so was, so he doesn't need to know all the details, but fine. Um, so, yeah, so there was moments like that where you sort of yeah. go, oh, wow, you should totally verbalise that and mm. to put that out there. Um, yeah. Through to, you know, and consciously we might talk about this a bit like, but like over at other time where you can just, like he's one of the ways I can see it's visibly impacted him is he, through no real form of vanity or I'm not aware of any vanity, is he works out so much because he believes if he stays strong in his body, he won't get cancer. Mm. And I'm already seeing like things infiltrate their lives that I'm like, that's because of what they've seen through me. And mm. my eldest seems to think that being strong of body will mean you won't get cancer and works out at a level. He doesn't really play sport. He's not really in sport. Like I'd say he's never once done his hair in the morning. He doesn't really care for how he looks, but he puts an awful lot of effort into his physical exercise just because he wants to be strong. Yeah. And how does that make you feel? <sighs> uh, well, let me let me give you a little bit of context on that. So I, when I was a kid, my mum went had a, had suffered quite a significant clinical depression between the ages of like 10 and 16, which totally changed my dynamic with my mum and I became her parent and I became her carer. Um, and that relationship and that dynamic still is what it is today. It's the same. Um, so even through my cancer, I've had to support my mum because she's used to me supporting her through everything. Right. And I'm like, mum, you can't keep, I, you've got to support me. This is where you've got to back me. Um, anyway, that's a different conversation. Um, but so I've been in a situation where my life is through an indirect trauma has impacted me quite significantly. It's molded who I am as an individual. One of the things it has done is it's made me responsible for myself. So I never fall back on my parents for support or, or need or, or help. Like it's just like, it's my life. I've got to take care of myself. And so it's something like cancer. I feel quite comfortable with because I'm like, well, I can do this. It's my journey. It's my situation. I don't need help from anyone else. I can just get on with it and do it myself. Um, Anyway, slight tangent change again. Um, so I have been through a situation where I know what the impact of parent indirect trauma can have on you. Um, and I think I take quite a lot of comfort from that in that, look, I can't help it. None of this was done on purpose. If I'd done any of this on purpose, I would probably feel very differently, but I haven't. And this is not my choice. I've got a better relationship with both my children as a result of my cancer. I've spent a lot more time with them than I was doing prior to having cancers and I was working harder. Um, and my relationships with my kids are probably as good as I could ever imagine them to be. Like, I love my relationships with my children. So does it make me sad? Yes, of course it does, because you can see visible impacts of what it's done to that person and that they're behaving in a way or they've reacted to something that's not anything to do with them, but they're just feeling that this is the way, the best way they can deal with it. Yeah, that does make me sad, but at the same token, that's life and everything happens. Everyone has experiences, traumas, mild traumas, instances in life which mold you and change you and unfortunately this is what my kids are going to have to do but there are some good things from it they're a bit more resilient they'll understand that life isn't just easy peasy and everything's handed to you on a plate they'll understand that there's, there's difficulties that you've got to navigate and that that's going to be good for them like there's other things about it that's a really shit that yeah. I wish they go through and the fact that they may lose their dad at some point sooner rather than later is shit but what can you can't do anything about it can't change it and apart from fight and do everything you can yourself to still be here for as long as possible yeah i i really um like you reflecting on your situation as well like with your mum and because yeah that does give a lot of context to you know the the complexity of our lives and like our coping mechanisms and where they come from and that sometimes they can be really positive coping mechanisms you know sometimes they might come from a stress but and there's no way of knowing what would have happened without the x factor happening i know i've got two childhood friends of mine both boys who um their mum had cancer and they have just grown into the most cool 
adults and are now amazing fathers. And I wonder whether some of that, you know, and there's no way of knowing, there's no A-B comparison, there's no way of knowing what was their traje- trajectory if they hadn't, but seeing them now with their kids and seeing that kind of depth of understanding that they have in terms of caring um, and being able to see it up close as a child, like actually what that might have given them um, is, is yeah, really interesting. And also at the same time, I imagine it, I'm, I'm, I'm extrapolating here. So you, you tell me <laughs> that there is almost the parent that you would have been and maybe the child that they would have been without cancer, cancer. And then there is the situation as it is. And there is both a sense of grief and also a sense of um, good things yeah, coming out of both of those roles. I, like it's weird, uh, and as I reflect on this a lot, but I wouldn't change it. Right. But I think it's, it, because everyone, you know, no, we can't, you know, cancer aside, everyone has to go through life changing events, young, old, in, in, in between, and things that evolve and, and sorry, mold and, and create people. And this is no different. And I think, like you've just alluded to, I also know children who've, who've had parents who've had cancer and they tend to be kind of in nature. They tend to care more. They tend to be more generous with their time. They tend to have better boundaries. They tend to be, look, there's some real big positives in people that I know who with people who've had cancer. And that could be great for them. That could mold them and create them to be the people that they're destined to be. And, that's absolutely fine. Like, and my job is, well, I've just got to try and stick around for as long as possible and enjoy this journey with them as long as possible. And that's kind of what my contract says now, is just to be there with them for as long as I can possibly do it. Well, I mean, yeah. You are, you are definitely living up to that contract. I mean, mm-hmm. oh my God, how many, like, you know, you were just charging through those surgeries and those chemotherapies. Like, yeah, like... You know that it's so much to keep up that contract that you're doing. Like it is extraordinary. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, Sarah, would you would you say that you've spotted some um, surprising, or you know, um, reactions that you weren't you weren't expecting, or maybe like isn't part of. You know, because the thing is, like, there's hardly any stories or reflections of this, like, really, even in the media, in, you know, um, but we sort of imagine, don't we, that, like, if someone has cancer, that everyone's going to behave, <laughs> you know, in this in this way. But it doesn't, it doesn't always happen, does it? It most definitely doesn't. And I think it doesn't really help when you see those sort of images of children kind of, yeah, um, yeah, they're unrealistic, aren't they? So I think I thought of a few examples. Mm-hmm. So I could really relate to um, Mark's example with one of his sons. So we'd been open with my with my daughter that, you know, mummy had a lump and mummy needed to have special medicine to take the lump away. And then um, this is where my treatment history gets quite complicated, but I eventually needed to have a mastectomy. So, and um, she was very literal about this. So, mummy had a breast, and mummy's breast was cut off. Um, so, yeah, and I can see you raising your eyebrows. So, you can imagine, so just picture the scene of the nursery picnic um, just before the summer. And um, my daughter suddenly announces in a very loud voice, so I'll anonymise the name of my surgeon. Mr. Williams cut off mummy's breast. <laughs> <laughs> and she then <laughs> when we went to the supermarket, you know, told the cashier, mummy had to have her breast cut off. Mummy's breast won't grow back again. And it was a, a little while before I made the connection that she thought that I could regrow <laughs> my yes. breast. So that's a kind of more humorous example. But a kind of, uh, I think an example, I mean, I can think of a few examples. So, you know, um, yeah, it was, um, so again, I remember, you know, you talked about the memories being seared, didn't you, Mark, earlier on your your memory, but um, 
that doesn't even make sense, does it? But, you know, the memory's being uh, seared okay. into your brain. But I remember coming home from HDU and I was really weak. And about a week later, I don't remember where my daughter's dad had gone, but we were on our own and she wanted me to do something and I couldn't do it. And she went into her bedroom and she literally trashed it. So, you know, again, you hear about terrible twos. My, so this is a good example. You you know, people are talking about the, their children's tantrums. So my daughter, so mattress off the bed, drawers out of the dresser, mm-hmm. toys across the floor, clothes of, over to the wardrobe. And I'm there with two drains, one on in each arm. And I literally can't do anything. Just sat on the bed and watched her. And... And there was a part of me that, you know, I thought, you go for it. (laughs) You know, I would do this if I could, but I can't. And and I just sort of had to sit there and watch her. And eventually she was like this little tornado that ran out of steam. And so this is the example, you know, so did she help you clear up? No, she didn't. She was, she was, yeah, she was just, you know, she just needed to express her rage, didn't she? Mm. And then really, really oddly, years later, so fast forward, and I don't know, I don't actually know if I'd recommend whether, you know, if you're a parent recently diagnosed with cancer watching the film um, A Monster Calls, but we watched it years later, um, and there's a scene in it where, I think the character's name's Callum, I can't remember, and... um, yeah, he trash he tr- he trashes everything. So it was really helpful for her then to see mm. that in the film and for us to talk about it. And really strangely, she didn't remember it at all. Um, we do have the pictures, um, but yeah, it was something. It, it, I and I just thought it had such psychological truth that that, that what happened in that film because. And it made me realise she's going through intense emotions that she can't, she hasn't got the words to express. And the only thing she could do in that moment was just to let it all out. And yeah. I'm, you know, I can laugh about it now, but at the time, you know, there's there's no way I was going to be able to tidy that up. We just had to sit there in this chaos. And of course, everything went back. Um, nothing, you know, was particularly damaged. And, and it, to be honest with you, it wasn't, wasn't like the end of the world. But and the, how old was she at that point? Yeah, so she, she would have been about five and a half at that point. It's a bit old for terrible twos, but yeah, she she was just in a, in a complete rage about... Presumably, Mummy had been away, Mummy had come back, Mummy was in bed. Um, and the other thing that she used to find really difficult, I think, was she was a bit competitive almost, so, you know... She, yeah. So she got chicken pox when, I, and and there's something really sweet. So you talked, Mark, didn't you, about this idea? It's like the yin yang, isn't it? The kind of the really rough bits, but also the really kind of strange way that you kind of see hope and resilience and strength through the terrible experiences you've had. But anyway, so she was off and she had chicken pox and we would lie in bed together watching DVDs. So it was really happy memories for me to look back on. But I remember her having a chicken pox on her arm and saying, you know, my hurt's worse than yours, mummy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm thinking, okay, your hurt can be worse than mine. We don't have to have... Yeah, you can win. (laughs) You win. (laughs) So I think that as adults, we find it really hard actually to put ourselves in our children's shoes and to imagine what it might be like for them um so yeah so I think this what I have this sort of sense of and it is a sense because now she's older she she doesn't remember the events so clearly I think she does remember the feelings but my sense is that you know it's kind of um she had to do her own, you know, she had her own experience that she needed to kind of work out in her own way. And it was my job to try and support her with that, even if I didn't always understand it, to kind of, yeah, just to kind of be there with her through it, which is hard because when you feel like it's your fault, Mm. it feels intensely painful. And I think there's, you know, you talked earlier about, you know, is there a pressure to be the perfect parent? I don't think there is, but I think the pressure comes from knowing that 
you want to make precious memories. So, you know, you want this Christmas to be right. the best Christmas ever. And of course, we all know Christmases, you know, bring their own tensions, don't we? So I think it's when when you, you know, those kind of frustrations, you have to kind of learn ways to think, take the pressure off here. This, It's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Take the pressure off. Yeah. Like, I, I think we don't do that enough, do we? Like, how do I make this situation easier? You know, like, I, I really like that. So... I could keep talking to both of you for for I hours, um, but I, I just thought it might be nice to end with, if someone's listening to this and perhaps they're kind of newly diagnosed and you know in a similar position, like figuring figuring out this 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 role as parent at the same time as as cancer. Is there any advice that you would give to them or your earlier self? Like, if you could kind of whisper a message back through time to when you were diagnosed, is there anything that you would say to yourself and maybe Mark? Pretty simple, I think it would be to be kind to yourself all the way through it, as much as you possibly can. I love and that. try not to feel the pressure because it's tough enough. And if you put pressure, and that, like, we talk about pressure, and obviously a lot of it does come from society or through, you know, peers and family and friends, but truthfully I feel like the most pressure comes from myself and it's me putting that pressure on myself to be or to do or to deliver to a certain standard and actually at times that standard doesn't have to be like like Sarah said you know if the house is t- a mess that's absolutely fine I, I, some of these standards don't need to be maintained because they're not that important so just be kind to yourself prioritize try and get a new sort of prioritization of what you want whether that be in the next hour in that day a week what you want to get out of that week and try and make that happen but be aware of your own limitations and you can't do everything life is not just going to continue as normal you've got to adapt so try and be kind and adapt i love that try and be kind and adapt that's awesome and uh sarah do you have words that you'd whisper to your your past self Mm, i think it's really hard to sort of distill it to some sort of like pithy points um I think it's all right to just make it up as you go along I think um I think there's something for me about you know kind of if that idea of like what would I say to my to myself in the past I think it would be something like you know this is going to be the hardest thing that you've ever done and you can't really imagine how yet but you know there will be positives in this so it's not to take away from how rubbish it all is um how shit it all is but there'll be ways that you come closer and you find value and meaning in places that you didn't even know existed so it's just this really sort of strange contradiction i think with cancer that we all feel which is really hard to put into words where you know, we, it's sort of like, yeah, I can only sort of describe it as like this sort of yin yang, really, that on the one hand, yeah, it's, you'd never want to, anyone to be in this position. But on the other hand, you just find, you know, the ordinary things, the everyday things that you used to take for granted and that people around you take for granted suddenly feel quite miraculous. So I think as a mum and as a parent, you know, you just cherish your children and their relationship becomes the priority. So I think for me, the piece of advice I would actually give is to think about ways, think about the kind of relationship you want with your child, think about how you can get through this together as a family um, and think about ways to kind of maintain and grow that relationship in a way that really matters to you, actually. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much to both of you for being here and and sharing so much. I really, really appreciate it. And also really appreciate all of you that are listening. And if you like this, please hit subscribe or like. It really helps other people find us. And actually what we're hearing is that as people find the podcast, they're finding Shine. And they're finding their community within the cancer community. So whether that be, you know, finding other parents with cancer and being able to have more conversations. Um, So just know that if you're hitting like, you're hitting subscribe, you're really helping, um, 
you know yourself and other people access the support that they need so and that they they like so thanks so much until next time bye